at New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. Thanks everyone for joining us today for this webinar on applying for BFRDP in 2019. And so a few housekeeping things. Um, first of all, we are recording this webinar and it will be made available on our website and also emailed out to everyone who signed up for the webinar. Please take a moment and connect your audio. You can connect using your computer or you can call in the number here with the access code and you can access the audio that way as well. All of the participants today, you're all muted um, due to the large crowd. So if you have questions or concerns, please use the chat box, which is located in the right corner of your screen. You can send a chat just to me, the host, or one of the panelists, or you can also send a chat to the whole group if you want everyone to see a question or something that you want to bring up. Um, so feel free to do that as we move through the webinar. We will have time for questions at the end, so you can either save your questions and type them in at the end or type them in as we go along as well. All right, so again, this webinar is for applying for BFRDP grants in 2019. And I'm joined with Allison and Laura. Allison is Strategic Development and Program Design Consultant for BFRDP. And Laura works as the Program Manager at Big River Farms in Minnesota. So they'll introduce themselves a little bit more as we move through the presentation. Our agenda for today will do introductions about new entry and this specific project that we have supporting the FRDP applicants, um, and then dive into the content of the webinar, which Allison will be talking about what we need to know about BFRDP in 2019. And then Allison and Laura will be talking about what you can be doing now to prepare. And then again, at the end, we'll have time for Q&A. So a little bit of overview about new entry. Uh, we are based in Massachusetts, and we do work on the ground to help support beginning farmers. We have an incubator farm project and also a food hub. So we do a lot of trainings, workshops, classes in order to support beginning farmers in our area. And then we also do work on a national scale to help support folks who are applying for the FRDP funding. Um, so we have a BFRDP Education Enhancement Team grant to help support inexperienced applicants who want to apply for a BFRDP. And the goal of this project has not been to repeat info that can be found online easily, such as reviewing the basics of the RFA, but really to encourage folks to think creatively and strategically about how to use the BFRDP to support the beginning farmers that you're serving. So along with our partners, such as Allison Goyne, we've worked to provide resources and trainings to help support these applications. Um, so we've done several series of webinar events related to this topic, and we'll send out those a link to those previous recorded webinars that you're able to access. We've also worked to provide some online tools, um, such as an online self-assessment tool, which really dives in and helps you realize if you're ready to apply for BFRDP. And that's available on our website and I'll send that out as well. And we've also developed an online portal where you can ask uh, questions and new entry staff or USDA staff will be able to answer them and give you more info about the application process. So a little bit more info about me and the work I do on a national scale. So I help to support two national networks of beginning farmer training organizations, one focused on those who are running incubator farm projects and the other focused on those running ag apprenticeship programs. And so these networks are really meant to help these organizations share best practices, curriculum and resources so they don't have to reinvent the wheel um, as we're all working to help support beginning farmers around the country. Um, also work to support BFRDP applicants, and we also do training and technical assistance for CFP applicants and grantees. That's community food projects, which is another grant 
out of USDA. And so you can learn more about all this info on our website, or you can email me directly with some particular topics you'd like more information on. All right, now I'm going to pass the ball over to Allison. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so I've been working with new entry for the past almost two and a half years now on this national EET project to provide technical assistance to applicants of BFRDP. So if you've been on other webinars, um, you've probably heard my voice. I have my own consulting practice based in the Midwest, but I work with clients across the country, and I have uh, a lot of expertise in USDA grants. Um, I've worked on 42 proposals myself, where I've done the whole proposal from beginning to end. Um, and I've also done extensive reporting and evaluation on grants that were awarded, so I've seen how the grants work from that side as well. Uh, I do have a website with more information about my consulting practice. I do private consultation with nonprofits, so if you have questions, uh, you can certainly go to the website or my contact information will be at the end of this presentation. Am I going from here, Lindsay? Looks like I am. Okay. So just a refresher, most of you, if you're on this call, you probably know what this acronym stands for or you wouldn't have been interested, but BFRDP is the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. It's a grant program that comes out of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. I say it NEFA, but I don't know if that's actually how others pronounce it. Um, it's a research department of the USDA and you might have even seen this acronym NEFA in, in headlines because there's currently a scuffle um, about moving the office of NEPA outside of DC and others are fighting it. So if you're seeing them in headlines, that's why. Luckily, it does not really impact too much this grant program, uh, but it is uh, it's happening right now. Um, let's see here. So uh, well, I guess I didn't say anything about the SRDP it is supporting beginning farmers and ranchers. And, and the primary thing to know about this program is that when they define a farm, they are really looking for people that are farming as a business. They're not interested really in any kind of community gardening programs or other really great innovative food programs. They're working on building the next generation of farmers who are going to farm as a business. Uh, the USDA defines beginning as farmers with 10 years or less of experience. So this is actually quite a broad umbrella, and I think many people don't realize that initially. Um, I've, I've worked with organizations like the one Laura is with, uh, Big River Farms, to actually look at programming for farmers at different levels. You know, one to three years is quite different from seven, eight, nine years, um, but all of those things fall under beginning. Again, the emphasis is on sustainable farm businesses and obtaining the, the business skills that farmers need for that. And they have quite a, a long list of topics that are approved under that umbrella as long as you're um, kind of focused on farming as a business. Uh, the basic requirements of the program, you know, I'm, I'm reviewing all these things again just to provide context and then we'll talk a little bit about what we know with the new Farm Bill, which is not that much, but basically the grant program is for nonprofits, um, colleges and universities, extension, government agencies. These are not grants that go directly to farmers. Um, they are for people providing training to farmers. So that's a distinction to be aware of. These are not like infrastructure building grants or, or loans for farmers themselves. They have had a very heavy emphasis on collaborations, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later on. And in past years, there's always been a requirement for a 25% match, which is your organization contributes 25% of the total budget of the project in non-federal funds. So in other words, the grant from the USDA cannot pay for 100% of your cost. You have to be getting some funding from somewhere else 
or provide an in-kind contribution of volunteer time or facilities or something else that will equal 25% of your budget. So what do we know about BFRDP in 2019? Uh, hopefully all of you know that we have a new Farm Bill that was approved in December. This is the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, one piece of really good news is that the BSRDP program was awarded what they call permanent baseline funding in the new Farm Bill. Um, they call it permanent, um, but it actually really only guarantees the first 10 years, and then there's some complicated legal things after that that I'm not qualified to talk about. <laughs> but um, the program has, you know, permanent status. Th this is great because we didn't know this until this year. So during the whole negotiations that were going on over the past year, nobody knew whether this program would even continue to exist. Now we know it will, uh, which is great. They have created a new umbrella program, which they're calling the Farming Opportunity Training and Outreach Program, FOTO. And FOTO, as far as I can understand it so far, is not actually taking the place of BFRDP, but it's going to act as an umbrella over the BFRDP program and then another program that some of you might know, which is uh, shorthand the 2501 program, which is the Outreach and Assistance for Socially Disadvantaged Farmers program. And so 2501 and BFRDP are going to both be under this FOTO umbrella. However, they have separate funding streams. So my interpretation of the fact that they have their own funding levels is that they are going to keep operating pretty much as separate programs, but they're coordinated under this umbrella. I don't know how that's going to work exactly, but I do know that for BFRDP, the funding levels are going to start out slightly lower than they were and then increase over time. And then for 2501, they're actually going to start out slightly higher than they were and then average out. Um, again, the 2501 program is, is focused only on socially disadvantaged farmers. The FRDP has always had a priority set aside for programs working with socially disadvantaged farmers. So it'll be interesting to see how they sort out those two. I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, a couple more things that we know so far is that they have uh, a new focus or an added focus on food safety questions and also on retiring farmers and succession planning. Uh, and there was also language about added emphasis on farmer input into program design and planning, which is why we have Laura on the call and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, there's always been a requirement that farmers provide input into your programming, but it looks like they're really even going to beef that up more. So I don't know how they'll um, put teeth in that, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, the National Sustainable Ag Coalition, NSAC, is doing all this analysis right now on the, on the new farm bill. And so they have told us that they're going to have more of a deep dive of information on BFRDP in the next couple of weeks. So we expect that we'll be able to share with you uh, hopefully some more information in our next and final webinar in this series, which will be February 12th. Um, they've also told us, though, that with the shutdown and the fact that the Farm Bill is brand new and like was passed right before the government shut down, and at the same time there's all this chaos going on about is the NEFA office going to move outside of D.C.? Um, it's a slow process. So, you know, the timing's all off this year, so there's really no way to predict what, what's going to happen. Usually the, RF, or the RFA for BFRDP comes out in the fall, and it would have been due around this time of year. Obviously, that's not going to happen. I think uh, we will see an RFA this year because they're going to, you know, there's, permanent funding, there's funding this year, so they're going to want to get that funding out, and they'll have to have agreements to get that funding out by September 30th, which is when the federal year ends. Um, but we have no idea how far out they'll get it, so stay tuned. Um, anything that we hear will pass along. 
So knowing that there's a lot of uncertainty, but that there is going to be an RFA for this program in 2019, it behooves all of us to get ready now. Um, I see this over and over again, and I, I, I think people don't always take it seriously, but there's no way that you can put together a quality proposal for any USDA grant program if you wait until the RFA actually comes out. They will only give you, at the most, usually 60 days to get your whole proposal done. And uh, if you've ever done one of these proposals, you'll know that they're extensive and there are many, many requirements. Uh, there's a lot of documentation and a lot of attachments and a lot of detail. So if you want to be successful, you absolutely have to start well in advance of when the RFA comes out to put your plans together. Now, of course, there's gonna be some details that might change with the RFA, but we're not gonna really see a huge shift in the focus of this program. We know it's gonna support beginning farmers. You know, we know some of the key priorities are about sustainable farm businesses uh, and that farmers are involved in programs. So some of the things you could do now, if you haven't applied for a federal grant before, you have to register in two different systems one is the grants.gov system, which is where you actually complete your application and submit it. And the other is called SAM. It's the System for Award Management. Um, we've put together some links and resources on these systems. They're on the new entry, the FRDP Technical Assistance page, and we'll send out links after the webinar to everything that exists um, resource-wise. So there's places that will walk you through that. But it can take sometimes up to two months to get your federal registrations active. So you can do it now. Once you are active, it, there's no cost to register. And once you register, they're um, active for one full year. So you should be just fine for whenever the RFA comes out um, if, you, if you get that done. And you can also then go into grants.gov and start understanding some of the systems. Another thing to do now is identify your partners, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But as I said, the FRDP is a collaborative program. They require that you are working with other organizations or partners. Not all of your partners have to be eligible applicant entities, which means uh, you could partner with a farm, for instance, even though a farm itself can't apply for this grant. You can have partners from all different sectors as long as you're working together towards the same goals. Um, the other thing to start doing now, especially because it's winter, is to gather farmer feedback and input. So if you're a farmer training program, you're in the off season, you're, you know things are gonna start ramping up in the next couple of months, and then once it's summer, you're gonna be incredibly busy. So now is a great time to be doing this work. Talk to your farmers, and I'm going to switch it over to Laura in a minute here to tell us uh, about how they've done this really, really well and successfully. They've had three BFRDP proposals funded, including one that's currently active. So um, she knows what she's talking about. Uh, and then we'll come back to these other topics um, in a minute. So as I said, we have spent two years putting together resources for BFRDP applicants. Uh, new entries organize them all onto one web page. One of the things is a, a self-assessment tool. You know, it's based on the prior RFA, but it still will walk you through the basic eligibility requirements. And if you get to one where you're not meeting the requirement, it'll give you some resources and links and things to how to get ready and how to meet that. Um, we have a whole series of past webinars. Um, also, NSAC, I mentioned before, they did a really interesting evaluation report where they looked at prior grantees from this program across the country, <clears throat> excuse me, and asked about their outcomes. And then they compiled everything into a really interesting report and they made some recommendations on best practices, things that seem to be working. So it's worth taking a look at and that's on our website too, just to get ideas about um, things that have worked. Uh, collaborations are key. Like I said, BFRDP requires all applicants or all applications 
to be collaborative. Uh, you need to partner with other organizations or, or businesses or educators. Um, if you are new to this program and you've never applied for a federal grant before, um, you can partner with a more experienced organization and they could take the lead on the application and you can be a partner and have some of the money subcontracted to you. And it's a great way to get introduced to USDA partner or grant, excuse me. So partnerships take time to work out. Uh, there's a lot of discussion that has to be had, especially if you are looking at sharing funds. Uh, Laura could probably also talk about that because we've worked together on a number of um, grants where there were many partners and uh, all kinds of different challenges from working out those partnerships. So that's something to start now as well. And there is a whole separate webinar on the partnership topic. This is the past criteria for partnerships and collaborations just as an FYI. They really want the partners to be real partners and not just they gave you a letter to put in your application as a supporter. <clears throat> they want partners involved in uh, actually delivering the work and designing the project and you know, evaluating it. So uh, just as an FYI. Okay, so I am gonna pass things on to Laura now. Laura's a colleague of mine. Um, Laura and I have worked together, oh, I don't know, almost six years now on a number of different projects, including two BFRDP awards. Um, and Laura manages the farmer training program at Big River Farms, which was also previously called Minnesota Food Association. So I'm gonna pass to Laura and we'll go from there. All right, hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me, Allison and Lindsay. Um, so, as Allison mentioned, my name is Laura Mirafuentes. I am the Programs Manager at Big River Farms, formerly Minnesota Food Association, um, which is now a program of the Food Group. Um, I'm also a Project Director on our current BFRDP award, and I was the previous Project Director on another BFRDP award and other various federal grants um, that we've written in partnership with Allison over the years. Um, and so, a little bit just about um, our the organization. We run an incubator farm and farmer education program here in Minnesota. Um, we have a food hub and we do an annual emerging farmers conference for immigrant um, and other farmers of color. And um, we've been around as an organization since the early 80s and we've been doing farmer education since 1998. This is a picture of our incubator farm. So I'm sitting there in the office building right now, um, which is a one room office, so I apologize if there's background noise. Um, but it's a certified organic incubator farm, and so that's the focus of our program. And we're working with farmers of all different backgrounds with a focus on immigrant farmers or other farmers of color. And as Allison mentioned, we've received three BFRDP awards since our program started. And I am going to talk a little bit about how we've incorporated farmer input into um, our, those grant proposals and also just our program in general. And so to start, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about why we feel that incorporating farmer input into our general programs is really important. Um, so we use farmer input when making our program plans. So if I find out from farmers that there is a common challenge, for instance, if our irrigation system has not been working or always breaking and that's something that a lot of farmers give us feedback on, that's something that we would then include as a spending priority for the following season or in our grant proposal. So using it when we're making our budget. Another example of doing this is that in previous years we had a lot of farmers commenting on wanting more in-field help on the incubator during the evening and weekend hours. And so I used that information to incorporate a farmer mentor position who would be available evenings and weekends in the field into our last BFRDP proposal. And so that picture there is a photo of May Lee, who is our farmer mentor, working with a couple of first-year farmers. And it's gone really, really well. Uh, farmers 
have really been thankful for how much May helps them, and that's come out through more farmer input and feedback, and that has justified us expanding her role in our current BFRDP project. So that's one way we use farmer input to impact our program plans and budgets. Another way is just incorporating farmer interest in, in our program plan. So if there's a lot of folks that are interested in learning more about wholesale, wholesale markets, we would make that a focus of our program or proposal. So really using farmer input to guide what we, ta what we talk about in our classes and what types of farms we visit and what our curriculum looks like. Obviously, farmer input also helps identify program strengths and weaknesses. So one example of this, in writing our last BFRDP proposal, we acknowledged that our production-focused classes were really highly reviewed by farmers over and over, but people were not still as confident in their financial management and goal setting. And this was also evident not only in farmer anecdotal reviews, but also in the percentage of farmers who were meeting their goals, who were keeping records, um, the number of skills they were reporting to have learned in those areas, and dollar amounts and profit they were making. And so this year we incorporated a partnership. Allison mentioned we use a lot of partnerships in our programs continually. And we incorporated a partner who is really good at teaching financial planning and goal setting into our current BFRDP proposal to improve those parts of our curriculum. Um, and I just wanted to mention too that when you discover from farmer input what farmers are identifying as program strengths and weaknesses to make sure to address those, um, build on your strengths in your BFRDP proposal and address how you're going to overcome the weaknesses that farmers have given you feedback on. Farmer feedback also helps us build farmer accountability and ownership of the program. Obviously we all know nobody really likes to be told what they should do or how should they be doing something. And so implementing farmers' ideas, it's always easier to create buy-in and sell the program to other farmers and, and funders as well. So one example of, of this, in our last BFRDP project, we started what we call our shared plot program. So the two farmers in the picture there were part of our pilot shared plot program. Um, when our program started off, we had a lot of people that came into the program with a lot of prior farming experience, but in recent years we've had more and more people coming into the program that don't have a lot of pre previous growing experience. And so rather than starting them out on their own independent plot, we, um, based on farmer input, um, we decided to start more of like a shared plot model where farmers are farming together with more mentorship. And so that was really designed based on the feedback that farmers who were starting out in an independent plot were having a lot of um, trouble and were not really being successful and they wanted more mentorship and to have more of a team. So that was another example of something that we have um, developed based on farmer feedback um, and it's continued to evolve over the, over the years and into our current BFRDP project. Um, and another way to use farmer input, obviously, is for grant reports. So using farmer quotes or farmer percentages of farmers that have said yes to a certain question on a survey are, is great just to provide back to the funders. And so next, I'm going to talk about how we collect farmer input on our programs and our projects. One sort of obvious way is we collect post-class evaluations. So every time we have a workshop or a training, we either will do a oral survey where we ask farmers to raise their hand, yes or no, to a series of questions. And we also ask people for examples of things that they've learned. Um, we've also started doing some, some written surveys at the end of classes as well in order for people, if they have anything um, if they don't feel comfortable saying out loud what they've learned or giving negative feedback on a class, they can do that in a written way as well if they're able to. We also do a, three individual one-on-one -on -one meetings with each farm team every year, a goal-setting meeting, a mid-season meeting, and a review meeting. And at each of those meetings, if there's anything, I always am incorporating a question about feedback on our program. So it's not only to evaluate farmers' performance, but also to get their feedback on how our program is working for them and how we're helping them meet their goals. And the individual tools that we use is just like a farmer set goal setting sheet. So we have people 
Um, we help people one-on-one -on -one come up with goals that they want to achieve over the year, and we track their progress on meeting those goals, and we also do a skills assessment. So those are feedback, I guess, self-reflective tools that farmers can give us feedback on whether or not they're learning what we hope that they're going to be learning in the program. Another tool that we use are farmer listening sessions. So once every year, sometime during the middle of the growing season, about halfway through, we host a farmer meeting that is farmer-led. So we have a series of questions that we are curious to find information from farmers about, but I will work with a farmer in the program to facilitate the conversation so that it's not a staff person that is asking the questions and farmers can feel more um, free to share critical feedback if they have any since there are no staff present in the meeting. So there's a farmer facilitator. I have another person taking notes so that at least two people are writing down their perspective of what's being said in the meeting. So trying to get a more, more full picture of, um, of the feedback. And um, I also always try to make it convenient. It's never convenient to be honest in the middle of the year, but um, I do try to have it at a time when most people are on the farm anyway, so they don't need to make an extra trip. And I always try to provide a meal to make it easy for people to attend. And um, there's a lot of informal data collection that we do as well. So sometimes people will give you feedback randomly in the field and just tell you, hey, you know, I, I, I really wish that you would fix this problem that I'm always encountering out here. And so whenever we get any kind of feedback, positive or negative, trying to record it somewhere. Um, and that's something that's always a little bit difficult to do running around an incubator farm, but we do our best. And um, we also do exit interviews. So whenever someone leaves the program, we do a 30 minute sit down meeting whenever possible to get their feedback on what did they, what did they learn from the program? What were the positive aspects of the program for them? And also what are things that they see that we could have improved? And finally, we are this year going to be piloting a new way of collecting more input from farmers who have done the program in the past. Um, I am going to be working with a couple of colleagues to ask some open-ended questions to past participants about how the program has impacted their life, what they're doing now, if they have ideas for improving the program, and kind of in an open-ended storytelling fashion, we're gonna to try to record those conversations and evaluate what other impacts have our program had on people's lives, even if they don't own and operate their independent farms. And finally, I'm just gonna give a few tips for collecting farmer input that I have used. I already mentioned, you know, we use a lot of different methods to collect this input, and the reason for that is that not everyone is going to engage in the same way. Some people are much more comfortable providing written feedback. Some people really just want to talk it through with you. Um, some people are, are better giving feedback one-on-one. -on -one. They don't feel comfortable speaking up in a group, and other people might be just fine talking in a group. And so just asking multiple times throughout the year and also using multiple ways of evaluation and collecting that feedback is going to be the most the most effective way to get feedback from everybody in the program and not just the people that feel comfortable giving the feedback in one specific way. And along with that, I always try to use different evaluators and incorporating farmers as evaluators too. So I mentioned that farmer listening listening session um, we try to have farmers ask for feedback in some cases. And even I find that from one staff person to a next, certain farmers will feel more comfortable giving feedback to one staff person than they are giving it to the, to the other. And so I think um, having everyone on your team that's interacting with farmers, being um, aware of you know, the systems for collecting that feedback is important. Be sensitive to farmers' schedules and time. I think that everyone knows farmers are very busy people, and I never want to come to a meeting come to a meeting where I'm asking for their feedback and it's not organized or go way over the scheduled half an hour that I have with them. Um, I just try to respect time whenever possible, 
and also be really flexible. So I often do my one-on-one -on -one meetings on, eve on weekends and evenings with farmers, and I, I meet them at their workplace or wherever it happens to be convenient for them, um, just for recognizing that they're busy people, and it's taking a lot of, out of their schedule to sit down and eat with me. And with that said, I also check in with colleagues and coworkers to find out, is there anything else that I need to be communicating to these farmers when I'm seeing them in person? Um, and I try to kill two birds with one stone whenever possible. Rather than asking for two separate meetings, maybe I can just incorporate some questions into my meeting with the farmers. Um, I try not to ask too many leading questions. I mentioned I'm trying to be as open-ended as possible and kind of going with the flow um, just to get people's ideas and feedback as it comes for them naturally. Um, this is a little bit obvious, but never asking for input that you're not going to be able to use. I think there's nothing more frustrating and um, will also discourage future willingness to participate in a meeting if the farmers feel like they are giving input, the same input year after year and nothing's being done with the input that um, they are providing. Uh, keeping data organized is really important. So I have you know, continued to try to improve my systems for where am I saving the data that I'm collecting from farmers as I'm collecting it so that I know where it is the following year when it comes time to put together a grant proposal, I can quickly find it and reference it. I've often found that in my meetings, I, I tend to write handwritten notes about what farmers are saying, but if I stick those some, some in some file, they are hard to access um, without compiling them into some sort of report or uh, deducing the data, I guess, into some useful information. And the other thing is to, if you have a grant, to incorporate grant deliverables in your input question. So um, I always work with Allison when she's a consultant on some of our grants to help me do evaluation to make sure that if there's a question that I've promised to report back on in my current grants that I'm asking the questions to the farmers in the meetings as I'm having them rather than having to scramble when the grant report comes due to ask all the farmers some question that I forgot to ask them because I didn't prepare in advance. So those are my tips and I will pass the ball back to Allison. All right. That was fantastic, Laura. I mean, of course, I'm biased because I love working with Laura, but I thought that was really excellent, concise, and a good summary of best practices. So thank you so much. Um, next step, if you take the time to do some of the things Laura just described, which you absolutely need to do if you want to be successful with BFRDP, and it will help your program and your farmers in general, you want to take that information and then start outlining your program design. Uh, a, a program design basically means a description of your program and your activities, and it includes kind of the components of a strategic plan in the sense of uh, a few specific goals and activities that are going underneath each goal so that you're getting to that point. And if you outline things that way, you're going to be better prepared to put a proposal together because that's exactly the kind of information structure they're going to be looking for. So, you know, if you've got a, you're already running a farmer education program, you've got a place to start. But then you could kind of start outlining, okay, you know, these were key areas we heard from the farmers that we need to beef up. Laura gave the example of in their last proposal, they decided to add more uh, emphasis on business management and financial skills into the curriculum. They found a partner that was uh, you know, very experienced in that area, started having conversations with that partner about what the partnership could look like, how much the partner uh, would charge or how much funding they would need to carry out the work, putting a scope of work together. Um, all of these things really, I mean, it can take months. So it's definitely worth starting with now. Uh, you also want to start outlining your budget and put together your, your main expenses for the program and think about what you'd want to include in your budget. We don't know yet exactly what the grant amounts are going to be in the new RFA. Um, 
I'm guessing that they're going to be someplace in the same ballpark, around $100,000 a year. Um, but, and again, there, there's always been a match requirement. There's now going to be, I think I might have skipped over this earlier, there is going to be um, a match waiver, they're saying now, but we don't have any details on what will qualify you to waive the match. So uh, we'll have to wait and see whether that's going to apply to a lot of programs or not. Uh, another point to keep in mind is to put your agreements with partners in writing, even if it's just an email saying, it was great talking with you, you know, here are a few bullet points of how I understood the conversation and what we're thinking for roles. Because especially if you do things in advance, when it comes time to do the RFA, you want to have something you can reference back to, um, at least as a starting point, to say, oh, okay, here's what we talked about. Here's how we were thinking about structuring that. A partnership, the number one thing that can go wrong with a partnership is a lack of clarity around expectations. And so having that stuff in writing is going to really help you out later on and also give you a head start on the letters of agreement that you're going to have to put in your proposal. So there's a lot of good reasons to do that now. So next step, we are going to send a follow-up email for this webinar with links to all the resources that we've put together on the BFRDP program. Uh, we have one more webinar in this series on Tuesday, February 12th, so you can sign up for that one. Uh, I encourage you to review all the resources that we've got out there on BFRDP, and we're waiting for the RFA to be released. So definitely, as soon as we hear anything, um, new entry will reach out and, and pass information along. Again, the next webinar is February 12th, same time on a Tuesday. The topic is evaluating your beginning farmer training program, but we're probably going to do something similar half and half of more updates on the 2019 program, and then we'll talk a little bit about the reporting systems that are required with BFRDP grants and how to use those reporting systems and the structures that they require in advance to start thinking about how you're going to put your program together. Uh, here's our contact info. Feel free to reach out to any of us with questions. And we have a few minutes now for questions. So I think if you, um, you can raise your hand on the right hand of your screen or uh, write in a question and uh, Lindsay can help to We'll take that part. Yes, so I've got quite a few questions that have come in during the talk. Um, all great questions, so I'll start reading them off. And some of them I have possible answers, but Allison and Laura, please weigh in as well. Um, so the first question that came in was from Shana. She's asking a really good question. It's a bit long, so I'll read it all maybe once or twice. So she's saying, to what extent is this grant program focused on growing farm entrepreneurs slash farm owners as opposed to training and cultivating an agricultural workforce? For example, those aspiring to own their own farms versus those who might be more interested in a crew member to crew leader, farm manager kind of career path. So basically that question looks to me like, what is the what is the purpose of the BFRDP program? Is it more along the lines of helping people be become farmer owner operators, or can it also go in the realm of supporting people on on the career path of farming? Um, other other options that may not necessarily be full farmer. Um, and so my response would be that BFRDP is focused on people becoming farmers who are running the farm as a business. That is the focus of the grant in my mind. Um, Allison and Laura, if you have any input, would love to hear that as well. Uh, can you hear me, Lindsay? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure since I'm not presenter. Yes, that's my understanding as well. Like I said, it's, the focus is on farm businesses, and so really the emphasis is going to be on that farm entrepreneur or the farm owner. Um, I think that there is a real growing uh, 
question about this because, you know, it's mm-hmm. not possible for everybody to be able to start their own farm business. And we know there's limits on the current local food economies and um, ways for small businesses to survive. And so I think there will be more openness in the future to looking at other arrangements, like maybe uh, farmer cooperatives or some sort of collaborative farm team or something like that. So I wouldn't totally rule it out. I think you would just really have to make a very clear case for it and work within the reporting requirements for this program to make sure you're meeting the CFRDP outcome. Great. And yes, this is sort of an internal dialogue we're having with some partners that we're working on a project about helping BFRDP programs do better evaluations. And part of that dialogue is what is, how do we define success with this beginning farmer education work that we're doing? Um, because yes, obviously we want to create more farmers, but there's also other places of the pipeline in the food system that, that people go and pursue those careers as well, even after doing an incubator program or apprentice program. So I like seeing where people end up no matter what, but I think BFRDP is very focused on wanting more farmers out on the land. All right, next question is from Arthur. And this is a perfect question for Allison, I think. So he's asking, do any of the three of you do consulting outside of these webinars? Can we hire you to help write our application? And so I know, Allison, you are available for consultation. Um, would love for you to let us know in more detail what you're able to do, or maybe he can just contact you directly and you can talk with him. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Email me um, and we can talk in more detail about that. I do quite a bit of uh, private consultation on applications and actually this project, my role with this project is coming to a close next month. So I will be available to take on some CFRDP applications this year. Great. And Laura, he was also saying he would love to work with you too, if that would be possible. I don't know what your consulting, you do consulting work as well. Um, I haven't yet, but he can always contact me and we can see what happens. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I will. He sent me his email, so I'll, I'll uh, okay. connect you all. Um, we have a question from Kate. Is there an estimate of when the RFA will be released? And to be honest, it's hard to say, Kate. Um, it was supposed, it's normally released in the fall and I was just looking last year it was released in November and the due date was February 8th so at this time last year everyone was was getting ready to submit their applications and we have not had an RFA release due to the um, the farm bill being extended and then the government shut down so we are all waiting for the RFA as well All right, my goodness, lots of questions. Next question from Deborah. She said, you mentioned the NSAC evaluation report on which website can this be found? Um, that is available on New Entries website and also on the NSAC website as well. And so I will be sure to include that when I email everyone out the list of resources and the recording of this webinar. So you'll get that in your inbox. All right, question from Denise. Can you talk a little bit about how to determine who projects can count as a participant? What level of engagement with a potential farmer or new farmer is needed by the project in order to decide if that individual can be counted? Um, Allison or Laura, do you have insight into this one? Well, I think, um, I would need to know a little bit more detail probably about the specific program, but there's definitely multiple levels of uh, farmer participants usually in a project. So for example, with, with Laura's BFRDP grant, 
they do a big conference. It just happened last weekend. And uh, we count everybody that comes to the conference in our reporting to BFRDP. So they have maybe one interaction with the organization. But then we also count the farmers who are in the incubator program getting lots and lots of hands-on training and assistance. So, you know, um, I think it can, can be it's definitely both. Um, I, I assume that there might be some question if, if your whole grant was just built around like one-time training. I mean, you could probably do that, but you'd have some difficulty, I think, with meeting some of the outcome and evaluation requirements of really being able to make a case for how your program's impacting the participants. So that's maybe the main thing to think about is, is how much can you show that the participants you're serving at whatever level that your services are somehow assisting them with their farming businesses or becoming farmers or something that ties back to the FRDP. Great, thank you. And Denise, if you had another follow-up question about that, feel free to send me it via chat. Um, we just got another question in from Leah. Oh my goodness, she says, this is the best grant planning webinar I've ever attended. <laughs> Rather than just reading through an old RFP, I feel there was very useful direct and practical advice. And because there's very various perspective of BFRDP practitioners and reviewers, I really trust what was said. Um, she's also wanting to be connected with Laura and Allison, which I will definitely do. Cool. Thank you, Leah. Um, Laura and Allison, did you guys get any questions directed specifically at you in your chat? I, I did not. Okay. So that's all the questions I have in. Anyone have any last minute questions they want to send in? Otherwise, we'll include our contact info when I send out the email in the next few days, which has resources, webinar, PowerPoint, um, all this good knowledge that we want to share with everyone. Um, Great. Oh, here's one more question. Can funding be used to hire teachers in the programs? I would say yes. And then yes. can student can student tuition that is paid to the program be used to cover MAT? Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, oh, Nicole was just asking for clarification on that last one. So someone asked if they could hire teachers for the program as part of the funding, and that is a yes. And then was also asking if they run a program and there's student tuition involved in, in paying for the program, can that be used to cover the match? And that is yes as well to that question. Oh, I'm seeing a question now from Olivia. Is the only change from last year the fact that there's a waiver for the match? Uh, we don't know. The, the RFA is not out yet. So, um, you know, we won't know. And they won't, they won't tell us before it comes out. So you have to wait and see. I mean, likely, like I said, there's not going to be any huge changes uh, in the overall purpose. But as far as, like, you know, specifics, we can't say yet. All right. I think we're, All right. we're good. Yeah. Thank you both again, Allison and Laura, for your insight. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Stay warm. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.